The following episode of the Father More podcast features one Julian Alcarez as my guest. Julian is one of the founders of Street Parking, which is this massive, massive business where they provide coaching and workouts and a community for people who work out at home in their garage. Get it? Street parking, right? And this is a business that he founded with his wife, Miranda. He and his wife have two young boys with a third boy on the way. And it was such a fascinating conversation to get a chance to talk to Julian, who has been a professional athlete, highly competitive is, is in many, many different endeavors, learned a lot of lessons by making mistakes in his early 20s, really turned himself into this sort of like business minded guy and and turned his successes into something that he can teach an actionable thing that he can teach his sons about vulnerability and being uh, aware of their emotions and how they behave and react to things. I, I think overall, it was just a great conversation about how he has come to this point of having all these different hats to wear and all these different responsibilities and his practices in being present and continuing to grow into all of those different roles and responsibilities. I enjoyed it very much, and I think you will as well. Take care. Let's see. I don't. I, I guess we'll start with like the. We'll start with the biggest question that I have, which is pretty simple, Julian. How? How do you do? How do you do this? You have two. You have two young kids. A third on the way. You and Miranda are running this massive like. It's like, I don't know what, I don't know what word is like bigger than business. Like what's a word that's bigger than business. You're running one of those, you guys are running an empire. And it's like, how, how do you guys even manage? How do you manage to be a dad, a, a, a business owner, a husband, and also like Julian Alcarez at the end of the day? How bro? Well, you have to, it's a process um, that takes a long time. Uh, you have to develop yourself as an individual and then you have to constantly figure out what to prioritize um, as your journey unfolds. Right. Um, so for me, it was, it was wild from the beginning. You know, when we started the business, we didn't see it getting this large. We just wanted it to be um, a separate source of income because Miranda was working for progenics. I was, I had my own meal prep company that I thought I had momentum with. Uh, and that was just, um, an exhausting physical grind for sure. Um, and then we got pregnant. The minute Knox was born, it just continues to solidify like where you want to focus your attention on. Right. And we had the ability, we created a business around our lifestyle and we didn't create our life. We didn't make our lifestyle fit a business, you know? Um, and I think that was one of the most important things that we could have done. We just captured a story and, and made it happen. Right. And from there to now, obviously I'll, I'll have you ask stuff in between, but lots of self growth and figuring out what it is that I want to do with my time. What's the most important and in order for me to get to where I'm at now, I've had to learn how to really delegate tasks, constant delegating, realizing that, you know, yes, if you do something, you probably will do it really well. But then when you get to a point where the business that you've created now has the funds to hire people that can do it better than you, it, you have to lower your ego and realize like, cause at first, when you first start a business, you think you're the best at everything, but it's not true. You know, you see that you, you read all those books about business. They talk about, you know, you shouldn't be the smartest person in the room. And if you are, then that's not a good thing. Um, you know, and that that's very, you can see all that stuff start to unfold as your business becomes successful, you know? And so we hire people and we, that can do what you do, if not better. And then they just really care about what we've created because for me and Miranda, it's so important for us to make sure that we have our time with our boys. We realize that that 
those moments are very special. And for me, I, I watch a lot of videos on, you know, entrepreneurs and um, people that I respect that have gone through what I'm going through right now. So like the Kevin O'Leary's, a lot of financial people that when they when they're asked, what is the one thing you look back on and you regret the most? And it always comes down to one thing. You even look at the Gary V's, the Mark Cubans, the Kevin O'Leary's. They always say more family time. I wish I would have had a stronger connection with my children um, because you can see how easy it is for you to um, not think that that's going to fly. You think that in the moment, you're like, oh, it's, it's just another day. It's fine. I, I'm really busy. I'm going to spend time with them. Um, but it's, you got to figure out what kind of quality time you want to spend with your family and, and the boys in order for you to realize where you want to, how do you want to structure your day today? And I've kind of gotten to a place now where, um, if I go full send on business, it's going to take away from time with the boys, the, the time that I feel I want to spend with them which is extremely important to me. And that's just not something I'm willing to sacrifice because I don't ever want to look back and regret not having strong, powerful moments with my boys, especially now, like there's so much I want to teach them. Like they are my little students, you know? And of course, like there's so much that I can plug Miranda into this, uh, but given that this is a father's podcast, I'm probably going to stick to a little bit more of that. Um, but yeah, she is a huge aid to that whole situation like you know we we came together and created this powerful thing but we both have very similar points of view so what i say is how she views things as well and i want to always make sure that i'm there to help her be in that position as well you know as a mother mm -hmm. there's there's so much good stuff that you just touched on i feel like we're going to spend the next like 45 minutes basically just breaking down that like intro statement you made right there because that that in a way you kind of encapsulated a lot of and it, you correct me if i'm wrong here but it sounds like you encapsulated a lot of where your philosophy on like prioritizing your time you know how you uh behave around you know your kids how you behave with your wife how you behave in your business um, you know, you, you talked a lot about, you know, your, your sort of, you know, insinuated, you didn't say specifically, but you insinuated that you clearly spend a lot of time studying and trying to sharpen your craft on, you know, what your work and your business is, which probably also means that you are very, you know, process oriented with how you're sharpening your relationships and your parenting and all that stuff. So there's just a lot of good stuff to talk about there. And I, I definitely want to dive in. And I think we're going to, we're going to like rewind for a second here because sure. I love jumping into like the meat of it there, but I, it, it's interesting to hear part of what you're saying there, because it, it feels like you were right off the bat prioritizing your time with your, uh, you know, with, with Miranda, with your future child right off the bat, because one of the things that you might be known for, I guess, before street parking was that you qualified for the CrossFit games and then gave up your spot because your, your, your firstborn's due date was around the time that the games were going to be taking place. And that was a really awesome moment. There was, there was like a lot of, I thought it was one of the coolest things that we'd seen in the CrossFit space in general. Um, very rarely do you see someone who's, who's, uh, at that level of performance and at that level of capability, let go of the like the egotistical ties to their, their work at that point, their competitive side to, to be able to stay with their family and prioritize that. And obviously that's paid off because, you know, you guys have built a beautiful family, beautiful business, like, so, you know, kudos on that decision, but how was, you know, starting there, starting with, you have a partner, you know, you have a family, you have a, a child on the way and you have this like crossroads that, you know, obviously was a difficult decision to make, or maybe it wasn't that you had to choose essentially between you, Julian Alcaraz, the, the professional athlete, you know, the competitor, the ego, the man that is Julian versus, you know, this moment, this like watershed moment for your family, for your child, for you as, as a father. Yeah. So for me, the whole journey in competing was a very selfish one. And as it is for most competitors, it's like, 
you have to identify what it is that what's the what's your purpose for competing and if you don't i think that's where many people get stuck in the scene for longer than they should be and for me i had qualified in 2015 which wasn't my goal so when i had done that i blew past my goal that was supposed to be within the next couple of years and then I had a reset because I wasn't confident in myself. I think one of the biggest things that I was trying to prove to myself at that time was not to go and be a top 10 games athlete competitor, was just for me to overcome mental barriers that the confidence, to be a confident person and trust in your abilities to be great at something. And it wasn't necessarily the best because there's always going to be the best. But to be great at something, you already knock out a majority of the field because nobody, it's very rare that you see somebody with the mentality to want to be great at something. And then once they realize what it takes to be great, they let go of it. They're like, no, this is too much. Then, then there's like another level, which is then you take the Frasers of the world and the athletes that are constantly in the top 10. That was not my goal. My goal was to prove to myself that I had the ability to be one of the greats out there in the sport. But when I zoomed out, I didn't have a plan for what my, my realistic future was going to be. I think CrossFit filled its purpose for me as an athlete was just to prove to myself that I can do this. Silence the, the doubt that you had as a high school wrestler, as a, as a 18 year old trying to make it in LA in, in, as in the acting industry, the constant knows this is something that is in your control here because it's you constantly day in and day out wrecking yourself to be a better person of yourself and now put it to the test to be a great in this. You're in control of this. I remember the thoughts that I had going into the last workout where I was like, okay, this is, this is it. You either leave it all out on the floor and leave this sport and know that you've accomplished what you needed to or else if you don't do that you're going to look back and regret that you didn't because it's just a, such a moment a fraction uh, of time it's like a two minutes of your life that you just had to commit to going as hard as you can or however long that workout was and I made that choice in that arena in that corral that I was going to do what I needed to do to not to let go and feel at peace with walking away. That doesn't mean it wasn't difficult to walk away because then you always, then you always have people saying, you can do great, you could go out and you could, you could have done that. Well, maybe, but I didn't, I didn't want to anymore. That was not my purpose. My purpose now was to my family, to this business, to something that now was another journey. It was the next chapter of my life. And I re recognized that opportunity and I, we ran with it, you know, because you have to, as an athlete too, there are the peaks and the highs where you, you should capitalize on those moments because then after people's expectations, you, they don't see you the same way. And that's just the honest truth, right? Then they, they remember how you left the sport you know, most more than anything. Of course, you have your greats that just constantly have their moments, you know, that are a staple in time. But for me, I've done exactly what I needed to do. I, mo above all else, I've proven to myself that I was capable um, and that I belonged out there. And then it was time to focus on the next chapter of my life, which is I've never looked back ever since doing that. Yeah, I think one of the things that, um, one of the things that, that, athletes or uh very sort of like i don't want to say type a because that's such like a cliche way of re referring to like certain sets of behavior but almost like when you are based around when you base your your world and your schedule and your decision making around accomplishing a thing right that requires a sense of control you have to at least believe that you can control that outcome and you know, I've been a dad for two and a half months, so I'm very fresh at this, but there is little to no control about, about outcomes with my son. I mean, like I, I'm very, I'm learning very much that like he's, he is as his own human being, you know, I, I get to, uh, you know, I'm lucky enough to interact with him and, and 
play with him and he's starting to like sort of smile and laugh and recognize me and he likes spending time with me at least that's what it seems like you know i i, I change his diaper i hand him off to his mom for for feeding and stuff like i i'm a i'm a big part of that part of his existence but i don't have control over his existence and part of that idea of if you aim for accomplishments you you have a sense of the success comes from exercising that control and a, achieving that end goal but there is no real end goal when it comes to being a dad right there is no way that you can say all right i checked the box like lean back put my put my hands back and and relax right so how have you made that switch of going from this is in my control this is how i'm going to accomplish this thing and this is where my sense of purpose or of success or of um you know of just feeling good about my effort in this thing comes from when there isn't that box to check, when there isn't that sense of the final accomplishment of being a dad. You know, the next box for sure. So after that chapter, you turn the page and then you look at this opportunity that was given to us, right? I knew that I wanted to be able to show Knox and now my sons, like how, what hard work looks like, not only hard work, but working smart looks like. And we had been given an opportunity that if give, you can't just give that to anybody because you can start seeing where the financial success really can um, expose someone um, because especially if you don't have the education to handle that kind of responsibility. Cause everybody says, I wish I was debt free. I wish I was like, I had way more money, but then say you gave it to somebody. What are you going to do with that? Because money is a very, very powerful thing. Right. And if not treated with respect and, you know, and you use it to your best ability, then you just and put yourself in more problems. And then that could lead to a disaster in your family, in your relationship, because then there's financial stresses. I had dealt with my financial stresses in my young 20s, which I am so glad that I did because it taught me everything I needed to going into my 30s. There was like a curve, there was like a tipping point because in my 20s, I was being reckless. I had booked these films. I had like 60K in my bank account in 2008, which why did I not buy a house during that time? I don't know, but see what I'm saying? I didn't have the right people around me to mentor me, to guide me. I was stubborn. I was spending it on dates. I was going out to Melrose Boulevard and buying these ridiculous clothes. I don't know what I was doing. I had two sports cars at 21. Why did I do that? And I got one of them repoed and I didn't even care. Like I ruined my credit. I was just being so stubborn. And then I ended up spending my, from 23 till 26, all my time getting myself out of debt and being so, then I remember only having like 20 K in my bank account. And I was so scared to touch it and thank goodness for residuals because I had no plan. I would literally go out and pay off these debts that I had taken out these loans that were just wrecking me by going out and selling these cupcakes uh, at these hair salons or selling salsas at barber shops. Um, but to think that as funny as that story may be, I, and I was making like an extra thousand dollars of cash on top of coaching, on top of training. And, I, and then I started meal prepping. So I was hustling in many different ways and making it work, but yet I had no knowledge on finances. I was just, all I knew was get yourself out of this hole that you're in because it's not good because you have no, you, what, what's next. And then thank goodness. Then I met Miranda because then, you know, being the responsible individual she was, she made me question a lot of things. And I knew that she wasn't going to put up with the charm, the looks, because that only goes so far until some, a, a woman is like, okay, like what, what do you bring to the table? Like, you can't just walk around, then you're, I'm just your sugar mama at this point, you know? Um, and so I got myself to a point where knowing the route that we were going, 
I started reading books on finances. I, one of my neighbors who was our current full-time accountant started teaching me things. You start to, you know, have constant meetings with CPAs. You start watching financial videos. Then once you do all that, you start to read between the lines. And I think the most important thing you have to do is like, what works best for your situation? And all, all my motivation then came, I was already motivated with Knox. And then we got found out we were pregnant with Banner. And that just lit another fire underneath me. I started reading all these books because I wanted to show them how to do things the right way, because ultimately they will take over the throne. You know, and I would love to show them how to start a business. And that is so motivating to have your children watch you do something and then teach them. Like I have an idea for how I want them to start their first like salsa business at a farmer's market. So they work on their people skills and all that. So that is my excitement now doing all of this to pass it on to them so they can be knowledgeable and then continue to pass that because Unfortunately, my dad didn't have the financial education that I wish he had. He was, you know, he bounced from Mexico when he was 13. He ran away from home and he just actually, no, he was like 10 years old when he ran away from home. And then he went to LA and he just knew how to work hard. He just knew how to provide for us, but we were very low income. There was no talk that, you know, I, I could see, I remember looking at, one time I took like the, I found a bank slip from Wells Fargo looking at their savings account and it was like $3,000. And when I was in high school and I just remember thinking like, okay, you know, and I just, that hurts me. And I don't want that moving forward because um, it's tough. And now seeing his mindset now, you know, I, I still see my dad on a regular and how how much it affected him you know because i know i'm going to take care of him at the end of the day um, but i wish that he would have taught me things so it would have set me up in a different course but it ultimately all of that led to me just teaching myself everything i needed to but the boys brought a lot of motivation out of me so i can teach be their teacher mm -hmm. so how you know how, how did you find you because you talked about meeting Miranda and you were already sort of working through this, like the consequences of your behavior in your early 20s and learning a lot more about, you know, your agency and direction and how you wanted to sort of, you know, move forward in your life and how, how much you could like apply yourself in terms of the hustle. And I'm curious, you know, how did the, um, you know, how did that transition from, you know, single Julian to partnership with Miranda to, uh, you know, having a family, having a business, what other steps in your mindset happened in, in sort of like adjusting to these new circumstances? Because there's nothing quite like having a kid that like lights a fire under somebody. And you spoke about that, right? There's like, it's like this almost impossible to meet set of expectations that dads set upon themselves once they realize what this means for them. Like you can do everything possible to, to set this child up. And it's kind of like, it's in my hands. It's in our hands. It's in, you know, it's in my behavior that is going to get me uh, the, the, the end result here of, of like either taking care of my son or taking care of my daughter or not taking care of my kids. And I'm curious, you know, you, you talked about that fire being lit and you started studying and looking and wondering, but that's on like the business side, right? So like, how did Julian as a person adjust? How did you change as like a, as like a human? Like, did you, did you have to fix your, your habits? Did you have to become more, uh, you know, more uh, uh, prioritized with your time or more Zen or more, you know, sort of like accepting of your, your, your existing world and like sort of dealing with it or did you just kind of find you were able to like slide into, into those shoes without having too much of a, of a rough ride? Uh, the rough ride for sure was in the relationship between me and Miranda. And I mean, obviously it's rough too with, it was rough with Knox as well. So pretty much you have to unlearn everything that you've learned up until that point. So you have to, in order for you to be the best version of yourself, you have to figure out what are your ticks, what are the uncomfortable things that really trigger you and figure out why those things really trigger you. So we did a lot of therapy together 
me and Miranda. And I'm glad we did because, and then once I realized that I had a lot that I was internalizing, um, and we all do, we really, really all do. I think that's one of the biggest things that, um, people just won't admit, or even if they do admit it, they just choose to not address it, like look back at it. So, so many people, as a, the more, the older you become, you become more stubborn in the way you are. And people don't really like change. Like who wants to change in their mid, mid twenties, uh, young, in your thirties? Like, no, I know who I am. It's like, you know, you really, really don't actually. Communication for me was really bad. Uh, th that was not a good thing because especially as you become new parents, because that will really, really, because up until then, you think you, ha you know each other, but you don't, because now you're, now you're having to deal with each other's parenting styles, um, communication, you're, you know, you're supposed to be a mind reader. Um, and then when you get into art, you disagree with things like who's going to let go of their ego and how do you address those things? That is extremely difficult. And then dealing with to as a father you know it's really hard a lot of the times you feel useless in the first six months because you're like baby cries mom nurses and then if like mom's exhausted and gives you baby they don't really want you that much unless they want to take a nap but then they wake up and they, they want mom so you, you're like you're stuck there as a new father feeling useless like oh my gosh or why won't you like smile or this and that? You'll get like little glimpses, but it's in those rough hours at night where you're tired, you're exhausted. You know, it's a, it's a team effort or maybe some people don't treat it as a team effort, but that's also why a lot of people, you know, end up getting divorced during, uh, you know, the early stages, of, you know, with their kids because it'll really test your relationship for sure, you know? And so then I went through, I, I did a lot of reading on books as well um like the four agreements uh the way that we peaceful warrior um the alchemist all these things that because once we moved we didn't have therapists anymore the journey is ongoing it's constant the minute you figure the minute something triggers you that's a great learning opportunity so instead of being triggered and getting angry maybe you might react at the moment because we're all human so ultimately yeah we have emotions but taking that lesson and asking yourself, why did that trigger me so much? Because if you can figure out why that did and address that with, with yourself and then take that and communicate that with your partner, you're only going to make that bond so much stronger. I think that's what's missing with men is this attitude of what a man's supposed to be there's nothing wrong with vulnerability. Now, if you're going to be take you take advantage of vulnerability and use that to you know, uh, have people, you know, feel bad for you all the time, that's that's abusing vulnerability. You want to be vulnerable with yourself, be kind to yourself, and then use that to strengthen you, and then just keep moving forward. You know, and I think that is something that I really had to work on is constantly like just slowing down and asking myself, why are you getting triggered by this? Like, why are you getting triggered by this? And that was uncomfortable. It really, really was. Um, so yeah, but that's helped me get to where I'm at now. So having a, difficult conversations is no longer as difficult because you just get more comfortable with having them. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a lot of self like knowledge there's a lot of self like realization that you're describing here and that's a that's a very very challenging process it's something that i think um a lot of people they i don't know if they actively dis like just distance themselves from it because of how painful it can be or it's just you find a groove in your life with career relationship family work friends whatever and it's just, you know, quote unquote, not worth the effort to light everything on fire and try and rebuild from the ashes of that, because that's essentially what ends up happening. If you start going down that path of trying to figure out why 
you know, you know, t- taking control over your emotions, taking control over your reactions to things, taking control over the environment that you're you're in that might be, you know, uh, affecting those things in a negative way. That ends up being a lot of times the end result. You end up just basically trying to rebuild everything from the ground up, and that's incredibly challenging to do. And I'm I wonder how are you other than the example, the active example of doing this in your your day-to-day life, how are you communicating this to your sons? How are you communicating this to your kids that, you know, this vulnerability, this self questioning is, is a process that's absolutely worth investing in. So right now, um, uh, I also, uh, so I went through a series of reading books like the Montessori books. Um, There was other ones that I've read as well. And you start to realize that as adults, we're no different than children. You know, we've just, again, we just kind of become more stubborn and more set in our ways, but the, the emotion is still the same. Like, so yeah, you may mature and, you know, kids don't rationalize things as easy, but also if you become older and don't work on these things, you also aren't very rational. You become extremely emotional and I just do it in a more angry, passive aggressive way, you know? So with Knox, um, taking the time to slow down and meet him to his level is a very, very big thing. So as opposed to, you know, and of course there are times where like, I'm a little bit more uh, impatient with him taking the time to slow down. And like, so for example, if, you know, him and banner now, you know, get in an art, like he, he like hits banner or something. I will pick up banner and I won't get mad at Knox because then that'll bring fear to him. I will calm Banner down and then I'll come to Knox and just sternly look him in the eye and ask him, hey, buddy, were you mad? And he'll say, yeah. So then it keeps the conversation going. That way he doesn't learn to fear me and he learns to communicate with me. And then when I can, when he like drops his defense mechanism, he can then tell me why he got upset. And then once he's allowed himself to express himself, then letting him know, hey, well, okay, buddy, when you get upset, you have to tell Papa so I can take away Baby Banner. And then you don't have to worry about that, okay? But you can't hit Baby Banner because that really hurts him. Do you understand? He's like, yeah. And then I'll tell, can you please say sorry to Banner? He's like, I'm sorry, Banner. So when I approach things like that, you start to see like how that really, really gets them well, like good with communicating and they just respond so much better. Or if he like, again, validating their feelings, but also there's like a fine balance with that, right? So you can validate their feelings, but also as a parent, you know, that's why people are so different because, you know, ultimately you, you are a mirror image of your parents at point at times with how like they raised you. So when he tells me something like uh, I start, I try not to use the word be careful so much or like instill it to say, Hey, be aware of this or Hey, pay attention, pay attention to what's going on. Or if he says he's scared of something be like, Hey buddy, like, look, and I try to show him why not to be scared of him as opposed to like, no, don't be scared. Like, no, you're not scared, but he is scared, you know? So it, but it, again, doing that requires a huge, huge level of patience that not many of us have because we're so caught up in our own issues that we tend to take it out on our kids. There's been times where I felt like I've took it out on Knox before, especially when that's the di- things that are difficult to balance with street parking. When things in the community take off, when the page is going nuts, you want, 2020 was extremely difficult for us. And I had enough because Banner was only like eight weeks old. And then everything happened with, you know, the, the protest, all the political exchange, the heat and the, there's not one social media platform that didn't deal with that difficult navigating through that. Right. And that was really hard because you, I felt myself taking out on the boys where they knocked, I could just see it. He was like, Hey Papa, like, can we go to the park or can you do zoom zoom with me or hey papa like he just wanted to spend time he wanted my attention and i was like no it's not right now not right now you know and but when i and that does not make me feel good so what i'll do at the end of the day is always make sure to have my moment to slow down with him and when i'm talking midnight to say 
hey buddy, I'm really sorry today. I was really frustrated. I wasn't mad at you. Because whether you think that they, they start understanding, they really, really do. And then he'll say, oh, it's okay, Papa. Like, it's okay. I'm like, it's not okay, buddy. Just say, thank you, Papa. Because that wasn't okay. I'm really sorry. And I love you. And then it just, just gets that out of my chest. I feel like I can reset and start the next day feeling fresh again. Um, but, it, but like I was saying, it requires patience and attention to those moments. And I think going back to one of the comments I said earlier, where, you know, you take the successful people that just grind and they create what their version of success looks like for their family, but they didn't feel successful in the relationship with their kids. And those are the moments that I don't want to miss because it's so important. The first years of like five, seven years of their life sets them up with how they're going to be as adults. And so right now is it's the time, you know, and that, that those are the moments I'm trying to be present for. Do you feel that you found a, a manageable balance? I mean, one of the things that I've learned is that even I, you know, I, I'll, so I'll feel like a champ. I'll feel like a super like professional. I'm like, I've got this. I figured it out. I know what my wife's schedule is like. I know what the baby's schedule is like. We, we're going to be cruising easy peasy. And then, you know, he it's almost like he can sense it he can sense the overconfidence and then just sure. completely throws a wrench into the he's like you know what surprise chaos you have no idea oh. what you're in for so do you feel like you found a workable balance that's like you know in this moment right now i've got like you know 72 hours where i've figured out how to how to manage all the stuff and be present and be able to communicate these things and foster and then you know there's almost like a like you know the not like the car crash thing, but there's like a, there's like a, a big boom, uh, something changes and suddenly you have to recalibrate to that. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, because uh, those are the things I'm talking about because you try your best to do apply those practices, but it's like a, it's a hit or miss too. Right. Because then if the boys decide to throw a massive tantrum, Oh yeah. Like as a parent, you just gotta, you, you react and you instantly and you're like, Oh man. And then later you look back and you just, feel so disappointed you feel like you failed way more times than you've succeeded because and i know this because then all of a sudden knox will randomly you know he'll come and say papa i love you and then you just feel like crying you just get all emotional and you're like oh thank god i just needed words of validation like oh man this was hurting me so much it's so crazy how those little words keep you going because you do feel like you're failing constantly. They're crying. They, um, they're mad at you. There's constant times where I feel like, oh, he only wants to spend time with mom. And you're like, I'm not even the favorite anymore. It's in those times where I have to tell myself, keep doing what you're doing because just do your best. And that will be remembered because I always look back and I tell my dad this, no matter whether you think you failed or not, what I do remember from growing up is that you and mom loved me so much. That's what I remember. And that is why I will always be so close to you guys. And, and so in knowing that, and I remember he got choked up too when I told him that. And so I apply that same principle towards the boys. Man, doing my day to day with love towards them. Um, I'm hoping that that's what they'll remember and they won't remember the bad, the, the Papa, uh, Papa said no to watching this episode or Papa said no, you know, it's all the laughing, the happy moments that they'll remember, you know, it's the, those experiences for sure. Yeah. Um, I, my brother has a saying the, the days I'm, I'm sure he got it from somewhere. It says the days are long and the years are short. He has three kids like seven, five and four. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they were, they're just now starting to turn the corner from having like, you know, kind of a crazy life with like these really young kids back to back to back, um, to like the kids starting to be able to be a little bit more autonomous and like, it's, yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, I know that, you know, one kid is re is real it's challenging but it's relatively simple. I mean, I, I understand what his needs are, especially at this age. It's like, I understand what his needs are. Uh, I understand how, you know, I can play a role in essentially supporting my wife while she 
cares to his needs like because there's only so much that i can do sure um and you know i i also see my relationship with katie my wife uh sort of it 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 has morphed in a lot of ways right it's like it's it's we're we're way way more on a teamwork level than we ever have been before which is really beautiful i think that's a great thing i mean we've had to figure that out as we were going through it because that that's kind of the way that i think everybody has to in a way um but your relationship with Miranda, I'm curious, how do you sort of like water that plant, you know, with so many things going on, you've got the business, you've got the kids, you know, you, you've got another one on the way, like, how are you, how are you making sure that that relationship is still, you know, growing and being nurtured and sure. you know, being sort of set up for success in the future? You know, it's so funny, because even uh, recently, we've had to have conversations about that, because one, you know, she's a third pregnancy. Um, we're like, how, you know, we only have four and a half months left. You know, she's very stressed and overwhelmed. She has a heavy role in street parking. She programs the workouts um, with the coaches. Um, she does the social media marketing, just her presence alone and what she brings to on her social media page. Being a mother, we're developing an app. We've been doing it for the past two years for the street parking members that, you know, Miranda, one of her biggest, um, you know, strengths is also her biggest weakness because, because she's so attent, you know, she has so much attention to detail and she's so uh, organ and just has it down. She's so talented, but it, it's also what makes things difficult because, you know, it's hard for her to let go. And then there's a relationship with the boys because then she feels like she she's not having enough time with them. And then you're right. Then it comes to our relationship, you know, and I've told her like, look, in cases like now, you have to realize that we would try to spend time together at dinner time, but then we're both exhausted. I always make sure we have dinner after we put the boys down to sleep. We go downstairs, we have dinner, but we're just quiet. We're so tired. And that the last thing you should do is have a try to have a conversation with your spouse when you're tired, because then there's no rational thinking. You guys are just going to get easily triggered and then it doesn't go well at all. Um, so I've pitched to her I'm like, look, I don't want to take this away from you because I know this is what's happening. But I think we do need to we have Monday morning dates, breakfast dates like that's on the schedule. Monday morning, every morning um, we have breakfast um wednesday we'll always go have lunch together um but it's but but it's so quick so i've proposed to her look maybe on saturdays as opposed to like I'll, how about this i give you monday through friday as opposed to having to worry so much about our conversations and dinner because realistically they're not filling your cup because i i told her i was like and i have the time to delegate but you don't and that you're not feeling fulfilled because it is on her and i said so let's do this let me support you because i know you you're anxious to get to work because you have so much on your plate well i'll walk i'll get the kids down help get the kids down you go have dinner and then go in the office until this app's done saturdays though we will have a date day so we'll go have lunch and go do either a movie or just go out and go do something that that way your cup is more full and you know that we have something to look forward to and that we have the ability to connect when we're not exhausted and it's not at dinner time. So, cause you read this book, anti-fragile, I read by uh, Nassim Taleb, I think his name is you, you have to like going in the middle is pretty difficult, right? Because you never really feel fulfilled. You either have to go one extreme or don't in certain situations, not all, but in this one, I said, look, why don't we just go 100% focus on time for ourselves on Saturday and we'll do this. And she's like, okay, sounds good. And that, so you, that's a constant navigation as well. You have to be able to feel present in what's going on um, and healing what, hearing what she's needing and help with that and be like, okay, well, let's try this. Let's try this until you get to a point where, you know, you just feel your cup is, you know, being filled up because it's uh it's rough. And now we're about to add a third. Oh man. It, it's good. Yeah. That's, I, I, uh, 
I'm a huge fan of Taleb, by the way. I, I, I mean, I, I haven't set up a, a bookshelf or anything in, in my office. I actually moved all my books into our living room or our dining room. Uh, so yeah, the entire set, his entire Incerto is like on that, on those shelves over there. So I'm a huge fan. Um, and I yeah. love that, that barbell model. I use that. Exactly. Yeah. There it is. It's the barbell model. Yeah. I, I explain, I, I try, I try and explain a lot of different things to people with the barbell model that the middle is the dangerous ground, um, for, for a yeah. lot of different behavior. Um, and you know, what, what I'm picking up here is that you have a, a practice of read, study, you know, introspect, apply, reevaluate, repeat the entire process. And, you know, the, the questions have signed kind of sort of, you know, flowed this path. We talked about how do you balance your, your life as, you know, uh, as like a man, as a competitor into this business, into this relationship, into this family, how do you, you know, uh, do, raise your kids to have the same sorts of, you know, mind, the vulnerability, the, the, the processing in their mind to be able to accept their emotions and talk about their emotions. How do you, you know, foster the relationship with your, with your wife? How do you, how do you foster Julian Alcaraz? How do you, how do you continue to grow the man that is going to be the role model, the leader, the business owner, like the person that is Julian Alcaraz and, and how do you prioritize that and make that happen? Sure. So uh, taking it, uh, the time to look at what a good goal to achieve to get so you have to have goals and then micro goals right um and knowing that this journey doesn't stop right because the minute you stop finding purpose is the minute you failed life right and then because you know i've also read these uh the blue zone the book called the blue zones where they went to found these sentience in different areas um and that people that live into 90 uh, 100 years old plus and the, the common thing is one, they, they eat well, um, they, they, they stay active and they have purpose. They believe in something. So, which is easily applied to fitness as well, right? Making sure that I never uh, always surround myself with people that are going to not allow me to slack, um, to push myself in all aspects in life. So for example, fitness, surrounding myself with people that enjoy fitness and truly enjoy it because they'll always pull you back in when you feel like you're feeling lazy and don't want to do it just to continue that movement right because if you're surrounding yourself around an environment that doesn't have that that's contagious you know there's a book called connected that talks about this so much there's studies off and on and that's why they always say who are your circle five circle of five and who do you surround yourself with because you know you can try to set all these goals that work in the short term but ultimately who you're around is going to suck you back in to the things that you're you're used to and it's hard to pull out and then when you finally get to that point where you've gotten away from the things that you know uh, made you that you're trying to get away from then there comes the obstacles of the hurt that comes along with that because now you've you're changing course in life and you're letting go of things that you felt were such an important part of it you know like family friends um so for me realizing that relationships come and go do your best with nurturing the relationship with people that are around you at the end of the day the most important ones are my family and you know and the people that are in my circle um just holding them to a standard um and being okay with setting a standard right because that's what's keeping me who i am now and so i love you know this um, i'm venturing off into real estate and um, we bought in properties and learning all about that and being okay with not knowing things. I think the biggest thing that I've picked up is that when you jump into anything, it's going to be overwhelming, something that you're not comfortable with, but it only takes like, like for example, books on real estate or even nutrition. It took like three to four books before you start picking up the language and then you start understanding it. And then once you do that, I think where people fall victim when they start reading all these books, they feel like they have to adopt exactly what the person said and they don't take what they've learned and applied it to their own personal life and they get lost. And I started realizing that there's only so many books that I can read before. Okay. Like I really actually have to apply this and I have to gain experience because that is 
I mean, ultimately all these books came from experience, you know, that's how they wrote the books in the first place. So creating my own story, um, constantly challenging myself and humbling myself to learning things and also getting to a point where I've acknowledged just because you know, you can be good at something doesn't mean you need to be because let's just say, you know, um, I started doing this with uh, guns. I, I picked up a, you know, a hobby with purchasing guns and going to shoot them. And I was like looking into competitions and stuff like that. But then I had a moment of stopping. I said, well, wait a minute. If you do this, knowing the per- kind of person that you are, then you'll get sucked into this. And then it requires a lot of time. And now you're going to pull away from the things that you're trying to stay connected to. Because that's the kind of personality that I have is I like to really, you know, submerge myself into something when I, because I get excited about it, but then you get pulled away from the things that you going back to your, what are your priorities, you know? So that's, and then I realized I'm like, okay, just because you can, doesn't mean you have to, but knowing that you can is a very important thing to learn as much as you can on the topic. So you don't get played a fool, um, but stay your course you know, stay your course. And I think for me, it's just constantly reading the room, making sure that I'm always connecting with the, the, the street parking team. Cause we have like 50 people that work for street parking, you know, and then um, dealing with all these new ventures that we're dealing with. And then again, with, uh, and then there comes the family and the, the relationship and all that stuff. So um, being kind and figuring out which companies to be full, you know, filled up and constant adjustment for sure is, how I kind of approach things. It's like an infinite work in progress. Oh, 100%. And I love that though. I love the challenge um, of that actually. And um, it's, it's great. It's been really, really great. So how are you feeling? You know, actually I'm curious, did you always know that you wanted to be a dad? I did. I actually knew that I wanted to be a dad, which is really weird because I told Miranda like that I wanted to have kids before we even talked about marriage. Um, that was really backwards. Um, but we did. I come on uh, a little too strong there, Julian. I did. I did. <laughs> uh, it was so odd. <laughs> but I knew I wanted to be a father. And I love every moment of it because, you know, as you'll know, and you're going to continue to know, it just brings, you just learn so much about yourself um in this journey of being a father for sure so how are you feeling about about a third do you guys know a uh, boy or girl are you guys gonna just so we're the- having a third boy i uh strike three with three boys for sure <laughs> um it's so funny i you know i would have loved to have a girl um i don't i so again you're happy with what you get because it's it brings its own beauty to your life right uh i was kind of leaning more to, I would have loved having a girl just because I, I've never had a sister and obviously never, I knew that having a girl would have unlocked a level in life that I never knew, right? A whole different, no matter how difficult, I know people say, oh, thank God you don't have a girl. Trust me, you don't want a girl. It's like, but I think that's an important part of life though. You know, and I, and I think it would have brought another side of sensitivity that I never knew existed because just like having kids, you never knew what love really was until you held your first child. You're like, this is unconditional love right here, you know, because no matter what, I'm always going to be here thick through, through it all, you know, where with your spouse, you can have arguments and all this and this and that, but there's like a whole different, that's like a, its own kind of love, but this is love that you just never knew it was out there, right? And so, but with having a boy though, it's just something new because I think it's great for the dynamic with the boys that we have now, because I knew with Knox, like he was starting to, it, the world doesn't revolve around you, buddy, you know, and you can see how that can spoil kids because as parents, you give all your attention to them. So having a second, I knew it was going to be so good for him because then it not only for us as parents, but also for him as an individual to realize like, Hey, you're the old brother, buddy. Like now your brother is going to look up to you. It's you're now a, a protector. And then now to have a third one is something completely new for me because again, I'm only used to having a, a, an older brother. So seeing this dynamic, I am, I cannot wait to see how it unfolds, you know, and I know it's going to be crazy and chaotic, 
but I'm looking forward to that. I really am. Not only for me to manage three with Miranda, but just to see their relationship as siblings. I cannot, it's going to, I can't wait. I really can't. And what are their ages? What are your son's ages right now? So Knox is four, Banner is a year and a half. And then, um, and then uh, I have, I'm not going to tell you his name yet because I, I, Miranda hasn't released it to the crowd. So I, I, I almost slipped, but um, he will be born. <laughs> Good catch. Um, February 22nd, 20, 2022 or 2022. Okay. So yeah, two, 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 two is supposed to be the, the due date. That's, that's strong. That's really it strong. That's yeah. So it's great. I am really looking forward to it actually. Yeah, mm-hmm. I am. I am the youngest of three, uh, three boys. And I can assure you that, that, you know, in my family, I was given just so much leeway and so much like good vibes and just, I'm like the baby of the family still, you know, like my, and my brothers are a little bit older than me. We have a, we have an eight year gap between myself and my old oldest oh, wow. brother okay. and a six year gap between me and my middle brother. So they took a little bit of a break. I like to say that they, they, they realized they didn't get it right and they needed to get it right. So that's why they uh. have me. So yeah, being the baby of the family is, it's fantastic. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> um, Holy, and this has been awesome. Uh, I, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me here. Um, you know, I, I love hearing about the different types of journeys that you know, various fathers have gone through uh, the the types of things that they've had to wrap their brains around the the changes that they've made within themselves. You sound like a voracious reader. Like, I mean, if you release your like book list, I feel like people lose their minds. Like, it sounds like you read a book a week, like the just, just wild amounts of reading there, dude. I did. I did a lot of reading. Um, I, I would definitely have read at least like a hundred books in the last couple of years. It's slowed down now because obviously more responsibility. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've learned a lot and I've gotten to the point, I think I got to the point where I just realized that I needed experience at, at, at that point. So I slowed down and I was okay with slowing down. There hasn't been a new t- subject that like, you know, you read books on investing and at some point they all say the same thing. Same thing with nutrition. All the books, no matter what diet you under, they all say the same thing at the end of the day. Eat whole and processed foods, drink your water, get your sleep, eat your veggies, drink, eat your meat. What, what You're like, okay. So, but you need that though. In order to understand how simple things can be, you have to understand the process to bring it back to simplicity. So, yeah. but yeah, I, they've all really, really helped me and I'm able to pull extract from many different ones and so funny you think you forgot about what you read until you get hit with the moment and you're like boom and then you apply what you read in that moment and it, and it's great so yes do read um or audiobooks is a big is a big thing especially if you have a hard time sitting down which i think a lot of people do yeah that 100 mm-hmm. yeah i have a um i have a buddy actually his name's julian and uh julian Julian loves to differentiate between, um, God, what is it? Methods and systems, something like that. He's, he has, he's, he has this differentiator and it's kind of what you're describing here between reading over and over and over and over again. And it's kind kind of seeing this information versus distilling that information into your context, your life's context and your experiences and finding out, you know, what is it actually talking about? Because there's, you know, you could hand somebody, uh, you know, the easy ones, like here's a workout plan, here's a diet plan, but there is at the core of it, there's something there for them to understand before that they, before they can actively create it in their own life and actually sort of like improvise it into the context of, of the real world. And, um, yeah, it sounds like essentially what you're describing between this idea of, yeah, I read a ton of books I synthesized a lot of this information. And then once I realized that there's a lot there that I, I'm sort of starting to turn the corner on, the only thing left from that point is to actually do the thing. And right. I think fatherhood's the same way, right? You can you can kind of understand. You know, if I gave somebody my schedule and my checklist and what I'm doing from like waking hour to when I'm falling asleep and they see it and they're like, okay, I get it. I can, I can kind of get this. And it's like, you can get it 
but you only get it superficially until you live it, until you experience it. And until you sort of, you know, put it into practice, it's a, it's a whole different world. And for me, selfishly, that's what I'm hoping to be able to do through these conversations. You know, I get to talk to dads who are in a lot of different situations, who have a lot of different, you know, family and business lives and, and work lives and career and, and all the different things. And I can sort of superficially start understanding what my next three years, five years, nine years, 12 years, 18 years is going to look like. So I can sort of see where, all right, I got to buckle down. This is what to look out for. I can put, I can like, you know, really put my focus on this thing. You know, this is about the time when, you know, X, Y, or Z is going to occur. And and these conversations might need to happen. How do I, how do I nip this in the bud before it becomes an issue? So for, for me selfishly, and I think for people who get to listen and experience the, the podcast, it's, it's really, really great to get a chance to hear from somebody who's, you know, got young kids, big business, you know, a, a, a relationship that they're, they're, they're working on and, and developing with not just the people outside themselves, but also with themselves. So I appreciate the honesty and I appreciate, I appreciate the time, Julian. Absolutely. Thank you again for having me on this, uh, on your show and your podcast. And I hope this helps uh, some of the people listening for sure.